Thank you everyone for joining us yesterday underwater. It was a really fun lesson for me, so I hope you enjoyed it as well. I've got a load of questions here to uh, answer, so um, thank you for sending all of those in and let's get started. These first ones are from Cayman Prep. So Theo asks, is there any invasive coral? And yes, there is a, a small one. Um, it's called the orange cup coral and it's not a reef building coral, uh, but it's in certain parts of the Caribbean. It's just a small orange cup, hence the name. You can look it up. It's Tubastria, if you like. I haven't seen it in the Cayman Islands, so I don't think it's here yet, but there is one in the Caribbean that I know of. And then Naz asks, have I seen any crown of thorns starfish? And no, not in the Cayman Islands, but I have when I was diving in Fiji and Australia in the Indo-Pacific. There's a lot of them there and I was helping to remove some of them from the reef because they eat so much coral, they're becoming a bit of a problem. <clears throat> oh, I like this one. So Holt asks, is it true that all clownfish are born male? <laughs> And crazily enough, yes, it is true. Um, over here, we have parrotfish and wrasse, and they can change gender as they grow, although they're born both male and female. But um, yes, uh, clownfish are all born male, but changing gender does happen in a lot of other fish. Gabe says, what is the biggest species of coral? <laughs> And it sounds like such a simple question, but it's not really because do you remember yesterday I pointed out that the corals were a, a big group of individuals that all live together and form a colony. So each coral polyp, we call it, each individual, it can be quite small, less than your fingernail in size or maybe up to your thumbnail, but then they grow together and form a colony which is what we see in these big shapes and those formations so that one boulder coral was one colony but it was composed of thousands of individual coral polyps so the boulder corals can get meters in size if conditions are good but then the staghorn coral can grow and form a colony that spans hundreds of meters. So the individual polyps, I think maybe the Montastria cavernosa, you can look that up. That might be one of the biggest individual polyps that we have here. But then as far as the colonies can grow, perhaps the staghorn, Acropora cervicornis, if it's allowed to grow without getting damaged. But yes, Bit of a tricky question that one. So Mary asks, since coral bleaching, is it rare to see brightly colored coral? And well, this depends on how long the bleaching lasts because if it's just for a short period, then the corals can get back their uh, partnered algae and recover and carry on with life. But if the bleaching goes on too long, then the corals will die and then what normally happens is the seaweed will land on the, that dead skeleton and start growing. So if the corals are able to recover, then they will get their color back. If not, then they will die and then that white skeleton that you see at the bleaching, well, it will get covered over by turf and seaweed and that doesn't have quite such beautiful colors. <laughs> Do you find anchors in the coral reef? Chanel asks. Well, sometimes, yes. I've been diving in the Indo-Pacific where there's a lot of wreckage from World War II and so you can see pieces of boats and sometimes propellers and things uh, on the reef. And you know, just off uh, Cayman Brac, there's the Tibbetts wreck. So you can see a whole ship there. Um, not normally, I don't normally see anchors though. And I, I don't normally see boats anchoring on the reef here in the Cayman Islands though. So that's a good thing. Jesse asks, what is a Dr. Fish's biggest predator? 
Well, they will get eaten by carnivorous fish, which are fish that eat other fish or eat animals. And depending on the size of the doctor fish, then that will um, limit which predators can eat them. So if the doctor fish is just a baby, then there are all kinds of fish that will be able to eat them. Most of the fish will be bigger. But if the doctor fish has got very big, then there will be fewer predators larger than it to eat it. So here, the carnivorous fish are, well, there's some snappers and grunts and grouper and jacks. Tuna come into the reef sometimes, barracuda, all of these. So I would expect that all of those fish could eat a doctor fish, but it might just depend on what size of doctor fish. Isla asks, why are healthy reefs not that brightly colored? And I think, Isla, this is probably because when we were filming yesterday, we didn't have time to white balance the camera. And so you know that it gets darker as you go in the water, but also the red colors from the light leave the, the water fastest. And that means that everything looks bluer at depth. And so what we do with our equipment is we hold up something white or gray and are able to say, this is what white looks like. And then the camera corrects for that loss of light and that loss of red. And because we couldn't do that yesterday, everything looked a bit bluer. But when you go snorkeling on a healthy reef, you'll see it is actually really brightly colored. James asks, what does regular sunscreen do to the reef? Good question. Well, there are compounds in the sunscreen that work on our skin to uh, protect us from uh, the sun's UV. And crazily enough, they sort of work in reverse for the corals. They affect the coral's ability to protect itself from sun. So it protects, our, well, it protects us, but it harms the corals. So, and it makes the corals more likely to bleach. So you can uh, check your sunscreen. Those that are made with zinc are pretty good for the reef, but there are these reef safe emblems that you can look for on your sunscreen to choose one that's uh, reef safe. Harry asks, what is the most populous fish on the reef? And I think maybe a species of damselfish or maybe a chromis. There's lots of them around. We also see big schools of grunts, but yeah, I think probably maybe a chromis or a damsel, one of those smaller ones. There's a lot, a lot of them. All right, our second last question from Cayman Prep comes from Adam who asks, what is the reef's biggest threat? So do you remember yesterday we were talking about the stressors to the reef and there are the global ones that impact the whole planet and then those local ones that apply in some places but not necessarily all. Well, the local stressors can be managed locally. So you, your friends, the people on your island can take care of those things and protect the reefs on your island. So for example, you could um, limit construction so that less sediment gets onto the reef. Or you could say no golf courses or agriculture on the shoreline and move that inland and then plant mangroves and sea grasses so that the fertilizer and extra nutrients don't get into the, the water and, and onto the reef. So those local stressors can be managed and handled locally if people are interested to do so. The global stressors that impact the whole planet are a bit more tricky. So we were talking about temperature increase being the big one and that results from in a large part from our actions and so to change that we need to change our behavior and that's going to require lots and lots and lots of people all over the world and it's also going to require our governments to change policy to reduce this temperature increase and so I think that's probably the biggest threat to corals because it's going to require a lot of people to care but good question thanks okay last one from Cayman Prep Theo asks what is the strongest coral 
Now, this is another tricky question because it depends on what it's fighting against. So if um, you're thinking about what's the strongest coral that can withstand physical damage, like a diverse fin kicking it or a hurricane, then that would be one of those big boulder corals. Those ones are pretty tough. But if you're thinking about those ones that are able to withstand temperatures or are able to recover quickest after a high temperature event that's killed lots of corals, then those might be some of the plating corals. Agaricea is one that we see a lot on the reef um, and it is able to uh, regrow quite well. So it depends on what it's fighting against. Remember, there are lots of different stressors and some corals are better able to deal with some stressors than others. Okay, so that's every question from Cayman Prep. And thank you again very much for joining me. So these are the questions from East End Primary. And we have one from Jaden who asks, what is the biggest species of fish on Cayman's reefs? And well, definitely um, a whale shark. Although they're not here all the time, they do pass by sometimes. And I know one was seen off Cayman Brac not that long ago, just a couple of months. So I think that's probably the biggest one. But if you're talking about fish that are here all the time, I think it would be one of the species of shark. So Peyton asks, how big can corals grow? And well, do you remember that corals are colonies of lots and lots of individuals all living together? So it's a coral colony that produces the um, shapes and the structures that we saw on the reef yesterday. So some coral species will grow and form big boulders and others will form finger-like projections and others will grow in sort of ribbon forms or plates. So there's a huge range of uh, colony shapes that um, the coral species can produce. Um, I think as a colony, probably the biggest one would be maybe the staghorn coral, because if it's not damaged by um, you know, disturbances or storms or whatever, and it's left to grow, it can grow really quite fast and it can cover hundreds of meters. So it would be one colony that's getting very big. But uh, the one, but boulder corals can also get quite big, a couple of meters across, again, if they're allowed to grow. They're a lot slower growing, and so you need um, calm, uh, need a, a long period of time without stresses for those corals. So, yes, I think probably the staghorn grows, can grow to the biggest sort of area. And then Simon asks, are there any endangered corals? And Simon, I'm sorry to say, they're all endangered, pretty much. Um, all the corals here in the Caribbean and most of the corals in the world are on the IUCN list. So you need to uh, have a look at that and you'll see there's very few corals that aren't endangered, I'm sorry to say. Um, and then we have one other question from Rainier Miles, who says, how do you know whether your sunscreen is eco-friendly or not? And well, sunscreen that contains oxybenzone is a problem. And um, there are a few organizations that are looking into, um, well, that are producing uh, reef safe sunscreens and promoting them. And so you will see um, an emblem that says reef safe. Um, and if you do a search online, you will find a really handy PDF document that will show the different organizations and the different companies that are making these sunscreens. So we have, oh yes, one other question from Kylo Packer who says, how many corals are there? Well, in the Caribbean, we have 65 species and several hundred species of fish, but I'll leave you to look up the Indo-Pacific because it's a whole other level. And uh, I think you'll be impressed how many there are there. And then one last question says, when chemicals from boats and planes go into the ocean, can it, can it affect the coral reef? And I would say if they land on the coral reef 
or the chemicals wash in, then absolutely, yes. I mean, we know that a lot of these chemicals harm the other organisms that come into contact with them. Oil spills do terrible damage to the marine life and the seabirds. So yes, if these things come into contact with reefs, I'm sure they would. So those are all of the questions and thank you very much for sending them in. Um, I hope you enjoy your next snorkel on the reef and get to see the beautiful colours that are down there. So we'll see you at the next Reefs Go Live. Have a good one.